Hey guys, this is Crafterman, and even though the Green Plateau series is still technically over, this is one of my last videos, and it'll be the timeline of the entire Green Plateau world. Now, I've said many times before that the Minecraft world did not begin when us players first started joining it. It had actually existed for thousands of Minecraft years before that. So this video will be a timeline of everything, from the moment the first Minecraft alpha code generated, up until the present. So, in the beginning, there really wasn't much of anything. This was just the first uh, alpha proto Minecraft code that ever generated, and it just generated randomly in the dawn of the computer era, somewhere in the midst of cyberspace. Now, remember, the Minecraft years don't really correspond to human years, but uh, the, you can always see what the Minecraft year is up here. So in the beginning, there was nothing. It was just a piece of code floating around cyberspace. But over the, over the course of the next few hundred years, the code began to stabilize, sort of. It began to stabilize by building firewalls to protect itself from the void of cyberspace. Firewalls that today we know as bedrock. Now, this bedrock was what separated the void of cyberspace from the actual world that the Alpha Code had created. And soon, the entire code was covered in this bedrock. So now there's a world, but there's nothing in it. It's just bedrock, and layers of bedrock keep on forming. But eventually there were so many layers of bedrock underneath that the layers on top didn't really need to be so protective anymore. So they actually began to soften up, some of them, into what today we call stone. Now this stone was pretty cool. It was kind of like bedrock, but it was softer, like you could break it. And, I mean, you could, but no one was alive to do anything yet, so no one really did. But yeah, soon it was stone that began to cover the entire world. And then the Alpha Code took it one step further, by making wood. Wood was even softer than stone, but there was, there was something else about this wood. It was very flexible in that it could be transformed, or rather, crafted, into other things. Again, it could, but there's no one alive to craft anything yet, and crafting tables haven't even been discovered. So yeah. But then, uh, nonetheless, wood began to cover the world. So now there are three layers covering the entire world. Wood on the top, stone underneath, and bedrock at the bottom. But the thing with wood is that it can burn. It just, uh, sometimes wood would get struck by lightning and it would start fires. But you know what, like, all that flexibility that wood has, the ability to create other stuff? Well, that concept, the code of that concept, was broken down by the fire whenever it did burn, and whenever there was a large pit where fire had been, all that code accumulated into what we today call dirt. Dirt had the concept of wood that it can create other stuff. Well, the thing with dirt is that it's not dirt itself that can be made into other stuff, but dirt has the power to grow other things in it, like plants. So that's how the first grass eventually grew. And one day, a new block formed. It was the softest, most flexible block of all, made of pure life energy from all the grass and stuff that was around it. It was called wool. And some of the wool got so, like, so energetic with life energy from all the life around it and stuff that it actually turned into a real animated creature called a sheep. It was made out of wool, but it could, like, move around and stuff. And what's really cool about sheep is if there's two of them and they both eat grass, then they can actually breed with each other and make even more sheep. So sheep soon began to spread around the world, except they had to stay near the grassy patches because that's where their food was. But nonetheless, they began to spread over the entire world. And uh, eventually the sheep began to evolve separately. Some of the sheep were different than others. Some of the sheep stayed as white sheep, but there were other color sheep too. And eventually these other color sheep evolved into completely different animals altogether. The gray sheep evolved into wolves, the red sheep evolved into pigs, the brown sheep evolved into cows, and the pink sheep evolved into uh, villagers. So yeah, these animals could do some stuff. They could, like, build stuff out of the wood that was everywhere, like makeshift shelters and stuff. But it wasn't... No, no one really made anything really creative until one day a villager named Ran discovered the first crafting table. He made it by combining four blocks of wood together. Now this crafting table was revolutionary because using the crafting table... You can use the wood around you to make really cool tools that you can use to mine stone to make even cooler tools. So, he was soon all the villagers that he told about this were able to make some really cool stuff. 
like they were able to make houses out of stone, and tools out of stone too, and they were able to use those stone tools to gather dirt and make farms and stuff. And unfortunately, since the villagers became the dominant race because they had all this cool stuff, they enslaved all the other animals too for their resources. And there was really nothing the animals could do about it because the villagers had all the stuff. But this was kind of the way it worked for the next, over the course of the next few thousand years, villagers built stuff everywhere around the world, and soon it looked like this. Well, not soon, like thousands of years later. Year 4000 kind of looked like this, and the villagers kept continuing to make new stuff, new, better tools, discovering more, like, cool blocks and stuff everywhere, and the, villi the village, well... And they, keep, they kept developing more and more. Now, this, it would kind of be what we today call like an endless village, because the reason villages look like this is because, uh, is because from these times, villagers learned to build this way. So it was kind of like an endless village, but there's no nature in between it, because nature hasn't been invented yet. But yeah, eventually the village got so developed that the Alpha Code couldn't sustain it any longer, and eventually the Alpha Code started to collapse. Now, I actually witnessed this uh, one in episode 100 of Green Plateau. I went back in time to the year 5125, and I was able to witness this myself. But yeah, when the Alpha Code collapsed, uh, the remains were, just by chance, picked up by a group of dogs that were currently enslaved, just like all the other animals, by the villagers. And the remains that they picked up from the Alpha Code gave them godly-like powers. They were able to do amazing things. But they couldn't let the villagers see them do it, because the villagers would kill them immediately if they found out that the dogs were dangerous. But what the dogs did was they created a secret underground world, where they made some really cool stuff, like plants and trees, which would one day become like the first nature. They uh, created lots of stuff in their secret underground world, which today is called the Nether. It wasn't all fiery yet, that came later. Um, but yeah... Once they were confident that they were ready, they laid waste to the villagers above. A lot of it got flooded completely, which they did with their godly powers and stuff, and the parts of it that were too high up to get flooded were burned down. But remember what happens when wood burns, when it burns for a long period of time, it eventually turns into dirt. So as the village burned down, it uh, left behind dirt everywhere around the entire world, and the parts that had been flooded became the world's first oceans. And the nature that the dogs had created in their other underground world spread to the entire world. So that's how nature was created. So nature in Minecraft actually didn't exist until the year 5125. So yeah, that's, that's basically how the world was created. So now I'm going to move up to the... Uh, I'm going to stop doing the slideshow and start uh, explaining stuff on a map. So now the dogs were in charge. Sort of. I mean, they had godly powers and all, but their only intention was to prevent the villagers from ever rising to power again. So they took some land for themselves and called it Kanaya. And they also controlled some of the land just to keep an eye on the villagers that lived there to make sure they stayed nomadic and didn't start building up their huge villagey thing again. Well, they only occupied half the world because they didn't know about the north yet. So the south half was occupied by Kanaya. But uh, the north half was completely free for the village, villagers to do whatever they want. So anyway, uh, the water from the oceans, now that there are oceans everywhere, began to evaporate and rain down upon the land into what is now lakes and rivers and stuff. So yeah, back to the villagers and stuff. So right now, everyone's nomadic, just living freely in the newfound nature of the world. And yeah... And the villagers are doing okay, they're just surviving like all the other animals. But some of the villagers want to recreate the life that their ancestors had lived. So, they had to do it in the north, because the south was occupied by Kenaya. Kenaya. So, uh, in the north, the first ever village was created. Now, this is the modern type of village we know today. It's just a small area of that village that, that kind of resembles the huge village that once existed. So, th those are the villages we know today. And soon... Lots of villages began to develop throughout the north. And then, the villagers united all their villages and planned to turn the entire north into one giant village, the way they had once lived. But Kenaya was ready for this, 
and they stopped them from doing that. The way they stopped them is they occupied this area and put a curse on it to make it completely deadly that anyone who entered this area would die. So that created a barrier between this half of the world and this half of the world, or at least of the villagers' world, and soon, since it was separated, it collapsed. So the villages still remained, but the villagers didn't have an empire anymore, and because of this, Kanaya no longer needed to occupy this. And they promised everyone, well, everyone who was able to hear it, that they would not use military force anymore, that Kanaya would just let the world survive on its own. So, uh, three people groups began to form. They were still all nomadic, but the westerners and easterners were separate because this area is all poisonous and stuff, and the southerners, uh, began to evolve separately because they had been occupied by Kanaya for so long, so they developed differently than the westerners and easterners, which used to be the northerners. Get it? Alright, let's go on. So these animals were just living around freely and nomadically, just like they had always been since the village fell, and there weren't any tribes yet. Until there were. Up in the east, right over here, a group of families united into the first ever tribe, called the Storiz tribe. Now this tribe was really cool, because since it was a tribe and all united and with laws and everything, people didn't have to worry about protecting their stuff, so they could make a lot of really cool things, and life began to get a lot easier for them. So everyone around them began to get jealous of how well they were doing, and tried to unite into tribes of their own, but everyone was fighting for power and they couldn't do it. Also, on the top of the plateau over here, the Plata tribe formed. They formed because they were isolated from everyone else, because they were on top of a plateau. And uh, in the west, farming is really easy because there's such fertile river valleys over here that everyone's settling near. And a farming uh, tribe begins to form soon, called the Durlan tribe. Now, it's uh, really good at farming, and everyone around them is buying crops from them because they're so good at farming. And it worked so well for them that they began to expand their territory beyond their original territory. Also, there's farming in the south, too. Three farming tribes form in the south. And they're having a contest to see who can attract the most nomads into their tribes. And they're also having a debate over which uh, system of farming is better. The Sergeth tribe is doing river farming, the Kraybash tribe is doing lake farming, and the Kiblok tribe is doing ocean farming. Also, the Storiz tribe knows that no other tribes are going to develop around them, or at, least, or at least they think so. So they feel free to occupy all the area around them and start being really mean to the people there. And the people revolt immediately. Two rebel groups form, the Kennels and the Yongres. The Kennels and the Yongres both want to gain independence from the Storiz, who are being real jerks occupying this area. And once they gain independence, they both plan to become independent tribes of their own, but first they need independence to be independent. All right. So they both start fighting off the Storiz tribe. But, but the Kennels are actually less focused on military, and they're more focused on developing their culture. But they still have to fight off the Storiz, so they're not really doing so well at fighting them off. So they ask the Angres over here for help, in exchange for economic support once they both become independent. And the Angres say sure, so the Angres help the Kennels gain their independence. Then they both get, become independent into the tribes Angria and Canalia. And then they become even bigger. Now, Canalia promised Angria the economic support because Angria helped them fight off the Storiz. So eventually Angria asks for it, but Canalia hesitates to give it to them. So they attack Canalia, and then Canalia has to build up a military just to fight them off. And then a bitter resentment lingers. Also, over here, the Durlan tribe isn't doing a very good job governing the new territory it took, so it, the new territories gain independence into the Komospesh tribe and the Navalov tribe. Also down south here, the Wenla tribe forms, and the Wenla tribe is annoying all the other three tribes by doing all three types of farming, ocean farming over here, lake farming, and river farming, and then they all attract more nomads who form tribes of their own. Over here, the Harcraft tribe just formed. It's the biggest tribe ever, and they plan to become the most powerful tribe ever too by having really cool systems of farming where everyone is assigned a job at birth, basically socialism. Also, these tribes begin to form even more tribes because they're attracting so many nomads. And then even more tribes form. The Kiblok tribe is attracting a lot of nomads too, but they're not doing a very good job integrating them, so they gain independence into the Regionala tribe and the Delo tribe. Also, remember how the Harcraft tribe supposedly knows everything about farming? Yeah, not really. It collapses. The Harcraft tribe still exists, but it doesn't have that much land left because all the other tribes gain independence. Now, the East isn't really doing so well. There's a massive famine here and everyone's starving. So they know they have to unite. So they unite into the Pan Lone tribe. It's a really big tribe. 
And the thing about this tribe is that each family can grow crops and sell to other families, which will create competition between the families. Now this is capitalism. So it works for a while. The famine ends, and almost everyone has enough to eat, so it works okay. Also, these two tribes, remember how they're still having the contest to attract nomads? Well, it gets really heated and escalates into a war between the Surgeth tribe and the Varshan tribe. And no one really wins the war, it just ends in a stalemate. And then the generals that were fighting the war get to keep the land that they took, and they, each of the generals makes their own tribes. Now, the Panlone tribe isn't doing so well either. Since there's such fierce competition between the families, there are two families, the Ping family and the Hind family, that are dominating, and everyone else is excluded. So the people that are excluded want to gain independence, they become the Kipes, and the Panlone tries to keep them in. But the two families that are competing in the Panlone eventually turn on each other, and then the entire tribe basically falls apart and splits into three tribes. The Kam Ping tribe, that's ruled by the Ping family, the Bai Hin tribe, that's ruled by the Hind family, and the Kipes, which were just excluded, but at least now they have their own tribe. And remember that how everyone's isolated at the top of the plateau here? Well, there's not really much food at the top of the plateau, so some people go to the bottom. So the people of the Plata tribe, some of them migrate to the bottom and become the Man Platin tribe. And it works pretty well, but the, the land is kind of alien to them, but they learn to use it anyway, and they occupy even more land. And then over here, in the Baihin tribe, all the poor people just had a revolution, and they made their own tribe that's going to be a democracy. The, some people in the Kamping tribe up here like the idea of a democracy, and almost everyone leaves the Kamping tribe and becomes these two tribes instead. The Kamping tribe still exists, but now it's tiny. Now remember the West. The West is all really good at farming and stuff. Well, most of the West is. But not this part. This part's like a mountain range, and there's not much food in the mountains. So everyone's always fighting each other for food. And since everyone's fighting each other for so long, only the strong survive, and now it's a, just mountains of fierce warriors that, are, that only survive because they were the strongest. And eventually, they all unite into a tribe, the Montane tribe. And it's a tribe full of fierce warriors because only the strongest had survived. Uh, but they still really don't have much food. Also, over here, the tribes finally figured out all their political differences and made peace with each other, and they begin trading with each other, and the trade becomes so successful that merchants from all over the rest of the east come over and settle here and make their own tribes over here. Also, the Trafnik nomads finally united into a tribe, the Trafnik tribe. And down here in the south, there's a bunch of people with this really weird religion. They're called the Malgazans, and they make a tribe. And they have a really weird religion, and no one likes them, but that's okay because they don't like anyone else either. Remember how the Montane tribe has no food? Well, since they have all these strong warriors and everything, they make a demand of all the other tribes to give them food. And Komospesh over here is the first one to refuse, so the Montane tribe destroys them and conquers their land, and then all the other tribes don't refuse after that. They also make an alliance with the Trafnik tribe, which also has a problem getting food. You see this part of the world? There are people living here, and they're just living as nomads, they don't really have a tribe, but everywhere else around them has a tribe, and they're being excluded and, like, being taken advantage of because they're the only ones in the area without tribes. So they make tribes just so they can have tribes, even though they're not really committed to those tribes. So the West and the South are both farmers, and they both have a lot of really cool farming techniques, and they're really excited to share those techniques with each other. So a tribe forms in between them, called the Anchur tribe, which is a trading tribe in between the West and the South, where they can exchange crops and farming methods with each other. And this becomes so successful that more tribes form around him. And the Rajlin tribe actually tries to steal all the trade by occupying some of this area, but it doesn't even govern it that well, and that area just gains independence anyway into two more tribes. Also, people in the Far East finally figured out how to survive. That's pretty cool, I guess. And also, the Trafnik tribe, just like the Montane tribe, was having a problem getting food. So they, too, occupy the area around them and demand food from the people over here. And remember the Malgazan tribe here that has that really weird religion? Well, there are a lot of people in the tribe who don't like the really weird religion, so they make their own tribe, where they don't have to be part of the really weird religion. So now here we are, in the year 6 to 800. There are tribes all around the world, and most of them are doing okay. But you know who's not doing okay? The dinosaurs. Yeah, there are dinosaurs in the world. But they're beginning to die out, because none of the tribes are growing the food that they need, and dinosaurs eat different food than all the other animals. So, a lot of them are beginning to lose hope. But then... The dinosaurs actually exist in these four tribes over here, and they're united by a dinosaur named Ba Roque, who makes a pledge 
that he will grow all the food that the dinosaurs need to live in these four tribes, which are now united into the Baroque Empire, the first empire to exist among the tribes. And there are also other animals living in these tribes, too. The only demand that the dinosaurs that are ruling the empire make is that everyone has to grow some dinosaur food so the dinosaurs can survive. And then they conquer these tribes in the middle just so they can connect all their territory. And the people of those tribes now have to grow the dinosaur food as well. But other than that, the dinosaur government isn't actually that strict. And over here, these tribes like the idea of an empire, so they unite into the Twilight Confederacy. They also begin to heavily criticize the Baroque Empire over here. And the Baroque Empire sees them as a threat and quickly takes them over, basically. And now that they have a much longer coast, they can attract water dinosaurs from everywhere that also want food. And now they have a really strong navy from all those water dinosaurs. So they easily conquer all the tribes to the northeast. And they plan to also conquer the tribes to the southwest, but at least some of them are prepared. And these three, three tribes survive, including Malgazan tribe, which is the one that has that really weird religion. And uh, they, the Baroque tribe decides to let these three tribes go. It doesn't really matter. They have lots of land anyway, and they're doing pretty well. Except the dinosaurs are doing well, but the citizens in the empire, like the animals that are not dinosaurs, are kind of pissed that they have to grow so much food for the dinosaurs, and they don't really want to anymore. So there's a revolution led by a man named Klaus Kohl, and they go on strike. And for a while, no one grows food. Everyone refuses to grow food for the dinosaurs. And in the matter of weeks, all the dinosaurs die out because there's no food for them. So then Klaus Kohl takes over the empire and makes a new government, the Klaus Kohl Empire. And it's now a democratic government. It's a democracy, and every citizen has a vote, supposedly. And then Class Cole finally conquers all the three tribes that Baroque never did, and occupies this area over here as well. Now, you know how it's supposed to be like a democracy and stuff? Yeah, well, it's beginning to get really corrupt, and it's led by, like, one party that basically rules over everything. And a lot of the people don't really like it. Especially these people. Remember, they had the Twilight Confederacy before the Baroque took them over? Well, they want a new place to be able to do what they want by themselves. So they seek refuge in these islands over here. And then Kanaya, which is led by the dogs, takes them in and gives them this land over here. This was the land that was cursed by the dogs that no one could survive there. But then they remove the curse and give the Twilight Pilgrims the land here. So now the Twilights have an empire, the Twilight Empire. And uh, this land is what today we call the jungle. You've seen the jungle in many of my videos. Now, remember Kanaya promised to not use their military force anymore, even though they do have godly powers. But they don't like the Class Coal Empire very much because they're worried that the Class Coal Empire might someday conquer the entire world, and it'd be just like when the villagers ruled everything. So they asked the Twilight Empire to do their dirty work and take take out the Class Coal Empire. And the Twilight Empire is very gracious because of, like, the Kenaya gave them all this land. So they say, okay. So the Twilight Empire develops a really strong military and takes out the Class Coal Empire. Also, remember these two tribes, Angria and Canalia? They're, they've been fighting since they were formed. And uh, they've been at a stalemate for like a thousand years. But then one day, a chicken named Phoebe comes to Canalia and teaches them lots of really cool military strategies and helps them to finally conquer Angria at last. And then they unite into what they call the Relica Empire. And Phoebe, the chicken who helped them, is now the empress of the Relica Empire. So the Relica Empire conquers all the land of the Far East. And they do some of it by force, but... Phoebe has lots of other good ideas for survival, too, and almost everyone joins the Relica Empire willingly. Except for the native Angrians who are in this tribe, they're very discriminated against in the Relica Empire. But there's nothing they can do about it, really, because everyone's so excited about Phoebe's new, like, rule over the Relica Empire, there's nothing they can do for now. Now, you might remember these tribes over here. The tribes that only formed because they needed a reason to have a tribe, even though they weren't committed to those tribes. But one day, a, d a cow by the name of Distan comes to these three tribes and unites them. And uh, they're the, the new empire is named after him. His idea is that he, since Distan has a really long coastline, that they would do a lot of trade with the western tribes over here who have lots of good farming techniques and sell the crops to the rest of the eastern tribes. And also, they would hire some of the westerners to teach them the western farming techniques 
and so they could grow really cool farms in their own land. And this is really successful, and business is going great. But there's another tribe here, the Sponar tribe, that's getting really aggressive because they just conquered another tribe, the Navaket tribe. And Deestan is afraid that Sponar might attack them to get access to the coastline, because the coastline is what made Deestan so rich because they were able to trade with the Westerners. And then their suspicion is true. Sponar attacks them. But then Deestan forms a really good military and manages to fight off Sponar. And it works really well. With the land that they conquered from Sponar, they made even more farms, which made them even more rich and successful. Conquering was so successful that they want to do even more of it, so they conquer all the tribes to the south. And then, they are still hungry, they're still even more powerful now, so the Deestan Empire wants to conquer all the tribes to the east as well. So they do. Well, most of them. The Manplatan tribe manages to keep some of their land, and the Plata tribe is left alone, because remember, they're isolated at the top of the plateau. Down south, over here, the Kreatif nomads run wild and kill everyone because they're mean. So the Deestan Empire and the Twilight Empire team up to get rid of them. And once they do, they each get a share of the land that the Kreatif once roamed over. The Twilight Empire gets to keep this part, and the Deestan Empire gets to keep this part. But the Deestan Empire kind of feels like it's unfair. The Twilight Empire has much easier access to their share of the land because they have all these islands, and Deestan is completely disconnected from this. So Deestan occupies this area over here, just so they can have a path to this land. But then Relica rushes in and is like, nope. And Deestan thinks that's totally not fair, because this land doesn't even belong to Relica. But Relica still tries to prevent Deestan from getting access to this land, because Relica is actually kind of scared of Deestan, and doesn't want Deestan to get too powerful. But that backfires because Deestan invades Relica. At first Relica is kind of able to hold them off, but then the Empress dies, and Deestan takes over all of Relica's land. Well, except for this part, but it's not part of Relica anymore, so it has a different name. But now the Deestan Empire is huge. It covers the entire east, except for a few parts. But, And they're really successful. They have so much farmland to grow, so many cool crops. And most of the citizens of the Deestan Empire are actually happy with their lives. You know who's not happy with their lives? These people. Remember, the Trafnik tribe occupied all this area and keeps robbing everyone in this area of their stuff. So a lot of them flee to the north and they become the Borealan guerrillas. They form lots of private military groups to fight off the Trafniks. And Trafnik is an ally with Deestan, so Deestan tries to help them deal with the Borealan guerrillas. And Deestan's army is the strongest in the world, but there's, the land up here is very unfamiliar to them, so they fail. Even though the Deestan failed over here, Deestan Empire is still really strong, and has lots of really cool plans to become even stronger. But the Twilight Empire is friends with Kanaya, who doesn't want anyone to become super strong and take over the entire world. So Twilight tries to stop them from going about their plans to become super powerful. And Deestan feels that this is unfair, so Deestan invades Twilight. And they have a long war on many fronts. But eventually, Deestan conquers the entire Twilight Empire, and goes ahead with their plans to make, uh, become even more powerful. Now, Kanaya, which is where all the godly dogs live, is getting kind of nervous because Deestan is completely surrounding them, and uh, they're the Kanaya's friends, the Twilight Empire, is now gone. So, Kanaya can't declare war on Deestan because Deestan's way too powerful for that, and Kanaya's not even supposed to use military force anyway. But what they do do, the godly dogs secretly weaken Deestan by maybe making violent storms occur wherever Deestan has farms and maybe mess up some of Deestan's communications, just to weaken them. And it works. Deestan gets weaker, sort of. But Kanaya is still really nervous that one day Deestan will take over the entire world. One Kanayan especially is really nervous. It's not one of the dogs, actually. It's just a normal citizen of Kanaya. His name is Ender. And supposedly, he has the best plan for making sure no one ever conquers the entire world. So he goes to the dogs of Kanaya and asks for just a little piece of land so he can carry out his plan. They say sure, because they kind of don't want anyone to take over the world either. So they give him a tiny kingdom for him to call his own, in the middle of Kanaya. But Ender's plan is actually genius. His plan is to occupy in a completely different dimension. So he does. He goes. He occupies a new dimension of his own and makes it the End, which is what we now know as the End, named after Ender, which is him. Now this is actually the most genius military strategy ever, because since he has a dimension all to himself, no one can stop him from breeding troops to make a really strong army. But he can still spawn those troops anywhere in the overworld that he wants. 
so he breeds an army of monsters that he genetically engineered. These monsters are what we know today as mobs. So he occupies some land, then more land, then more land. The more land he occupies, the more he controls, the more resources get sent to the end, and the more monsters he can produce. It's an endless cycle of him becoming more and more powerful. And Kenaya's glad that now it doesn't look like anyone's going to take over the world, but they're still a bit nervous, because Ender's actually going too far, more than they wanted. But Ender continues to conquer lots of stuff, and Ender forms an alliance with the Montane and Traffin tribes to help get rid of all these tribes in the west over here. So you see how these tribes are kind of like shaded gray? That's because it's getting really hard for them to exist, because Ender's laws are too strict for them. And then Ender makes the laws even stricter. Ender's law is that basically no group of animals are allowed to unite ever, just to make sure that no empire takes over the entire world. So basically it bans any form of government created by the animals, which means no tribes. So eventually Ender managed to dismantle almost all of the tribes. So Kanaya realizes that Ender is an extremist, and Kanaya doesn't really support Ender. But it's too late now because Ender is super powerful, he controls all this. And eventually a rebellion forms. There are rebel groups against Ender over here. And Deestan is sort of scared of Ender, and Deestan funds the rebel groups, but doesn't want to declare war on Ender immediately, because remember, Deestan was uh, weakened by Kanaya when Kanaya was scared of Deestan. So yeah, the rebel groups sort of built up a pretty strong rebellion, but, can, but Ender keeps occupying more and more land, and eventually there's no hope for the rebels, and they all fade away. Almost. There's still a rebel spirit, but they can't really do anything, because Ender's now too powerful. So Ender basically takes almost all of Deestan's land, and Deestan finally declares war on Ender. But it's too late. Ender's way too powerful, and Ender sends in some of his mobs to assassinate Emperor Deestan, and the Deestan Empire collapses. So now there are no tribes, except for the ones over here that are allied with Ender. And then eventually, Ender takes all of K Kenaya's land, too. So, Kenaya's worst fear had come true, that one day, an empire would conquer the entire world. But ironically, that came to be because someone was scared that someone would one day conquer the entire world. So in the process of preventing anyone from conquering the entire world, Ender conquered the entire world. Well, for a while. Just for, like, about uh, 50 years or so. But then, a new group of people formed, right over here. And it was led by a person by the name of me. Yep, now this is where the Green Plateau series began. This is where I first joined the world and first made a little land of my own, called the Green Plateau. And it was, it was just a really small little development at first, just for me to survive. And I had no idea that Ender wanted me out of the world anyway. I didn't even know anything about King Ender. All I noticed were that mobs kept attacking the Green Plateau. Now... The Green Plateau was counted as a civilization which broke Ender's laws, so soon Ender sent in all his goons to attack the Green Plateau, and it's you can see that it's shaded more gray over here. It soon became really hard to fight off Ender. Now, Ender had a policy for this stuff. He wasn't allowed to send his troops in, like, orderly fashion, but he just had his mobs just attack the Green Plateau every so often just to weaken it so that the Green Plateau couldn't rise to be too powerful. And one day, since it wasn't going fast enough, he sent in his goon, Kronos, to try to eliminate the Green Plateau entirely. But one of my friends in the Green Plateau, Kabuminator, actually killed Kronos. Kronos was King Ender's deputy. He actually used to be one of the Kanaian dogs until he turned to King Ender's side. And now he's dead, killed by Kabuminator. So Ender's really shocked by this. So he gives Green Plateau some land to operate in. So the rule is we can do whatever we want in this land, but all the rest of the world belongs to Ender. So that's okay for now. But there are actually some rebel groups around the world. Like, remember the rebellion that was over here? Some of them took refuge in the Green Plateau territory, and I teamed up with them, and we uh, started a big plot to get all of King Ender's troops to turn against him so that the Ender Empire would collapse finally. So we go to the end, and we stage something. This is a picture from when that happened. So all the troops would turn against King Ender, and it worked, and then the Ender Empire collapsed. So now, there's the Green Plateau here, and all this other territory left unoccupied. Now, this is actually really great for the Green Plateau, because now that Ender's gone, all this land is free for us to take. So we make some colonies elsewhere in the world. Villages. So some of it we take over from NPC villagers, but sometimes we just make villages by ourselves. And then we keep making more and more villages, and it's really fun. But then one day, the governor of this village, Village 11, wants to do whatever the hell he wants, and in the Green Plateau, we don't allow that. We have laws, but he doesn't want to follow the laws, so he attacks the Green Plateau. 
and we ban him, but he's really good at hacking, and he hacks into the world. His name is Petercraft, by the way, you may have heard of him. So Petercraft hacks into the world and makes himself the owner, just like me. So eventually we agree that we would split up the server and we'd each get half of it. So he would occupy the south half and I would occupy the north half. So this is the way it was supposed to work and we would try to coexist peacefully. That did not work at all. Uh, Petercraft had a lot of spite for the Green Plateau and wanted to take over all of it. So what he did was we did have a, little, a few squabbles over some territory here, like the village that he used to own wasn't part of his territory, but he still wanted to keep it, so we had to take it back from him. And also, he occupied a lot of the far west that wasn't even belonging to him. So yeah, there we basically were in full blast war, even though we tried not to. Also, he occupied the spawn, and this was a very good strategy for him because he was able to recruit new people that anyone that joined the server, he would recruit them into his new plateau. So, and he also began to turn people in the Green Plateau against the Green Plateau to his Blue Plateau. My own deputy, Kaboominator, actually turned to Petercraft's side in the Blue Plateau. So this had started a full-blown civil war between the two plateaus. Now, Kaboominator was now a new general of Petercraft's army, and he had a military plan. It was called Kaboominator's March from the West, where he would march from the west over here and try to conquer everything until he reached the Green Plateau. So he did conquer a lot of stuff. But right over here, we stopped him in the final battle. Now, something surprising happened, though. After the final battle, Kabuminator overthrew Petercraft and locked him in a prison cell, and then Kabuminator took over as leader of the Blue Plateau and signed a peace treaty with the Green Plateau. So the treaty was basically the Blue Plateau could keep all the land that it took, but the Blue Plateau would now leave the Green Plateau alone, and we would, would indeed coexist peacefully, just like we had planned to earlier. And now that Petercraft was and his aggressions were gone, locked in the cell, we were able to coexist peacefully, pretty much. And we agreed that these two territories would be neutral. We also drew boundaries everywhere to decide which land belongs to who. And eventually we started to develop more in our territories, because now we're not at war with each other, so we can afford to start developing more. And the territories that were owned by each of the villages, we now turned into provinces. Instead of numbers, they had names. So we had provinces everywhere. Also, you see this over here? They're a group of mercenaries that just came from the spawn and snuck over here. And this neutral territory isn't occupied by either of us, so they immediately take it over and make their own plateau, the Dark Plateau. And uh, there's still the Green Plateau and the Blue Plateau. And we kind of see this Dark Plateau here, and we're mostly okay with it. So now there are three countries in the entire world, for a brief period of time. There's also the Montane tribe that's just been sitting here this whole time, not being affected by anything. And the Dark Plateau develops extremely quickly, probably the fastest growing civilization I've ever seen. And also, since they're mercenaries, Petercraft hires them to break him out of prison, and Petercraft tries to rise up again as the new leader of the Blue Plateau. So there's a quote-unquote peaceful meeting in the Dark Plateau, where all the three leaders of the plateaus meet, and in that quote-unquote peaceful meeting, Petercraft tries to poison me, but I recover from the poison, and while he's still gone to the Dark Plateau, I attack the Blue Plateau, and after that, and now that the Blue Plateau has collapsed, the Green Plateau is able to regain control of the entire world, because remember, the Dark Plateau is just a bunch of mercenaries. So now, there are 12 provinces all throughout the world, and we're developing really quickly. Now this becomes an era of success and economic prosperity, because we're developing so quickly and everything and stuff and we invent like currencies and all the provinces began to trade with each other and it goes great for a while also remember this tribe the montane tribe that's just been sitting here doing nothing this whole time yeah well they finally attack ravinia over here ravinia is one of the provinces and uh they attack and destroy uh, one of ravinia's trading ports and capture and kill kabuminator the governor of ravinia and we get really angry and immediately destroy the montane tribe and we also want to find out why the Montade tribe did this. And But what we don't know is that they were actually commanded by a secret group of people from the dead called the Titans. Now the Titans exist in the lands of the dead, and they're made up of the worst criminals throughout Minecraft history. And their leader is Kronos. Remember, one of the dog who turned to King Ender's side. And remember, he was killed by Kabuminator. And then the Kabuminator was just killed by the Montane tribe. So now, the Titans, as they're called, they want to come back to life, but they're trapped in the lands of the dead. 
So, the Monte tribe attacking Ravinia was actually part of their plan. So they knew that we would look for them in the pit, and we did. We did go to the pit to look for them, and they knew we'd try to get out. So we did get out, and they followed us out. So they did get out, but they didn't go to the overworld just yet. They just started to spread her across the other dimensions of Minecraft. And also, uh, after we attacked the Montane tribe, a lot of the other nomads around here that are not part of the Green Plateau territory are starting to get really suspicious of the Green Plateau, because remember, we took all this land and drove out all the animals. We didn't mean to, we just had to develop because of the Civil War, and after that, like, there was nothing we could do. But, uh, there's a bitter resentment of the Green Plateau and all the rest of the world, and, uh, a lot of the animals here begin to unite into semi-sort of tribes, just temporarily, just in case the Green Plateau tries to invade these lands, too. Now, the Titans are spreading across the other dimensions, but remember, the Green Plateau is way more powerful than them, and we can easily take them out because we have so much stuff that we've acquired over the years. So, more of these groups keep forming, and uh, we, we actually don't know what's going on outside the Green Plateau. We're just focused on developing ourselves, which is currently going great. But then, one day, uh, some of the Titans land in the overworld and they occupy some land and make it their own. Now, once the Green Plateau figures out about this, we immediately rush in to try to attack them. B but before we can, one of the Titans, Selene, goes into the place where all our modded data, because remember this is a modded server, is kept, and she manages to d take out all the mods and destroy, like, basically, she ha basically hacked into the world by physically going into the place where the mod data is kept and deleting all of it. So now, everything that was modded, like all our modded resources, are now gone. And almost all our resources were modded, so now the Green Plateau is suddenly weakened because a lot of our resources are gone. And the Titans, remember all these groups have a bitter hatred of the Green Plateau, the Titans promise to help these people fight off us, because the Titans have them convinced that we're evil. So then the Titans spread super quickly around the world and make provinces of their own. So the, the Titans' goal is to take over the world from us, and become the new leaders of Minecraft. And we know that the Titans are evil and have crazy plans, so we have to stop them. And the Titan capital is over here, and it's ruled by Kronos. Remember, he's the lead Titan and everything. So the Titans start invading our land. They take over the province Durlan, and a few other places too. They tried to take over Tredonia as well, but uh, we sort of managed to hold them off. Now, we think they're just trying to take over all of our territories one by one. But what they really want is just to get into the Green Plateau capital over here and steal the code, because the code for the server is kept in here, steal the code for the server, just like they did with the stealing the codes for the mods over here. They want to steal the code for the server so that they can hack into the server and change all the rules to make it their own. So that's how they will really gain ownership of the entire world. But we don't know that. We're just fighting them for territory. So then they begin to take even more territory. Remember, they connect all this territory by like, taking over here and here and here so they can have a big ring around us. And also when they took over Durlan, it kind of cut off this part from this part. And they, one thing they do is they attack Ravinia from two fronts and take that over. And New Relic is a really weak problem, so they can take over that pretty easily, too. And then, right after that, we think all hope is lost because the Titan army is crazy strong and it keeps getting stronger. But then, right over here, in Navaket, we discover a secret underground base that the Blue Plateau had built when it was uh, still a thing. Actually, it's a big network of underground bases with so many resources inside it. What's important about these resources is that these resources are from vanilla Minecraft, not modded Minecraft. So uh, we manage, we take all these resources, and Navaket develops a military of its own based on all those resources that it just got from those secret underground bases. Now, the Titans still have a lot of land around the Green Plateau capital, which is pretty scary for us. And then they invade the Green Plateau capital just so that they can take the uh, server code. Right after they take the server code, they already have what they need. So they pull out all their troops from all these places and just focus on defending their capital long enough for them to develop the code enough to take over the server. But right before they do, we sneak in disguised as mobs disable their code from being used, and finally defeat the Titans and kill their leader, Kronos. So yeah, this is where we just last left off in the last episode of Green Plateau. So the Green Plateau has restored 
control to the Green Plateau, basically. And yeah, this is where I pass on my leadership to Vaporizer, who's this guy who killed Kronos, finally. And yeah, and after that is when I left the Green Plateau. So what happens after this? It's up to you.